So at the end of the last video, I was focusing on Andrew Jackson as the example of the man on the make, the, the man who was able to rise up from his frontier uh, background, came out of a log cabin. It's the same thing, the same narrative with uh, Abraham Lincoln. Uh, many of the politicians of the 19th century kind of fit into this, uh, this model, this idea that, that you would rise up from nothing and you could become the most powerful person in the country. Uh, as an example of the kind of meritocracy that, that was was really uh, more uh, possible in the in the 19th century than it is today, but Jackson, who was the trickster, who was the the prankster, the guy who invited prostitutes to a, a, a debutante ball, uh, the guy who was who was fighting with his friends in bars, uh, the guy who was dueling or doing all of these things. He he was the man who was sort of held up as as the the model of of. Uh, what was possible. Now, at his inauguration uh, in 1829 at the White House, um, all hell breaks loose. This is actually doesn't really show it. You can see it over on the right hand side. But but when Andrew Jackson uh, uh, comes to Washington, uh, he brings with him his supporters, about 10,000 people from uh, the area that he came from. And this was the Appalachian culture. So many of them were bearded. They were already drunk when they got to Washington. John Quincy Adams looked at this with horror as if the barbarians were invading the capital. You know, the Harvard educated uh, guy who'd spent a lot of time in Europe just thought this was this was the end of the world. This is just horrible. These people were, were uncouth. Uh, they swore a lot. They, they were just, you know, riffraff. Um, sort of, if you think about it, sort of the New Englander looking at the Trump voters and saying, you know, who are these people, the deplorables, the, 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 the kind of the, the, the lower class people, not necessarily the poorest people, but in terms of their manners, not very well uh, educated. And of course, this ends up leading to uh, an inauguration where the people are so psyched about Andrew Jackson that they actually go after him at one point. They chase him uh, back to the White House. He, he retreats to his hotel. And he had set up a a, a party in in the uh, in the inside of the White House, um, and there was all of this alcohol, and they had they had it in buckets, and people were literally breaking in through the windows. They were climbing in. It's sort of reminiscent of the insurrection. People just pouring into the White House um, just to get to the alcohol, and the, and the people that were working there actually had to put the, the they, they took the, the uh, pails out, they poured it into actually troughs where people were literally on their hands and knees, you know, drinking like animals, you know, to get their alcohol. And, you know, inside the White House, people are, you know, they're wearing their cowboy boots and they're, they're, they're chewing tobacco and it's just a disaster. And this is sort of seen as this is what happens when democracy takes over, it becomes sort of mob mentality, um, epitomized by Jackson's uh, inauguration. Now, one of the things that happens under a Andrew Jackson um, is this the sort of fear of the city and the idea of the confidence man. So the confidence man and the Horatio Aldrich stories are focused a little bit more on, on those things in this video. Um, this idea of how do you, how do you know who, you're, who the person is um, when you're in a fast moving urban environment and you don't know, you don't have any context for judging somebody. So can you judge them on their clothing? Do you judge them on the way that they talk? Do you judge them on, you know, how do you judge their moral character? And so there was this increasing fear that uh, the con man, the confidence man would earn your confidence. And, and, and this person was usually somebody who had a lot of charisma, a fairly good actor, usually a gambler, usually sometimes a, a businessman, or at least portrayed himself as a businessman, a successful businessman usually. Um, but this person was was also uh, a, a dangerous person. He could he, he could en end up destroying you, get you drunk, you know, lead you to the brothel, um, destroy all your youthful principles. And I think if you want to modernize this a little bit, this idea of the fear of somebody who's going to kind of um, take advantage of you. So this idea that that young people on the make, particularly young men on the make, were vulnerable. Um, and this is sort of the dark side of American social mobility. So the con man was a man of wealth and fashion, um, introduced you to beautiful women, introdu introduced you to a life of pleasures. Um, and he would uh, lure unsuspecting men um, basically through, through uh, essentially enslaving them, um, making them members of, of his personal cult. Um, through a whole combination of swindling and frauds and forgeries and faking of things. 
Um, so this idea of, of uh, your friendship and who you make friends with being, being very careful about this. Uh, the fear of the con man, the secrets of the city. Again, this is a person who frequents the bars, who frequents the clubs, who's kind of literally a shady character. You can't really always see his eyes. You don't always know who he is. Um, and a lot of people look at, at Donald Trump as an example of his modern example of this, somebody who, who again, uh, fakes his business success, uses the newspapers, uses, uses the media to kind of build himself up into something that he isn't. And this, again, the, the, the fear and concern of this uh, around this was really something that defined uh, the period that Tocqueville um, was looking at, which is the Jacksonian period. Now, the other part of American mobility uh, revolved around uh, the, the stories um, that were told in graphic novels. And, and this was the Horatio Alger story and the story of Ragged Dick, which some of you may have read about for homework. Now, all of these stories basically followed the same narrative structure. Usually it starts off with a, a, a young boy or a group of young men um, who are usually very poor, in many cases they're immigrants, uh, and they, they usually are, are working menial jobs, and eventually over time they find themselves uh, successful. So again, Horatio Alger wrote literally hundreds of these stories. Um, they were called Horatio Alger stories, and they were the stories of the upwardly mobile um, young man. Um, they were not rags to riches stories, technically. They were sort of rags to respectable middle class stories, which at that time was really a possibility. So these became very, very popular all the way through the 19th century. They were still being read um, at the end of the 19th century. So if you think about Ragged Dick, the story that some of you read, uh, Ragged Dick, as his name would suggest, his name was Richard, but he went by Dick, which was sort of his informal name. Uh, an Irish immigrant, uh, a boot black, so somebody who shines shoes, um, wears a, uh, an oversized coat, doesn't not very well bathed, but there is something about him that's attractive and good looking. So his looks are very key and his ability to promote himself are very key. So what do these stories get at? The stories get at the idea that if you work hard enough, your energy and effort will be rewarded. So, uh, Richard Hunter or Ragged Dick, when he's a young boy, you know, he gets up early in the morning. Uh, he works hard, whether he's selling newspapers or whether he's selling matches. Um, he's always out there kind of working his gig. Uh, this idea that if you work hard enough, American society is a meritocracy and you will be able to make it. The story gets emphasized again and again. Uh, but if you want to make it, you have to basically move up. And the way that, uh, that Ragged Dick moves up is that he not only hustles and starts to make uh, money, but he also makes friends with a guy named Mr. Whitney. And Mr. Whitney is a, a, a richer man, a guy who works in an accounting firm um, who's got a son named Frank. And so he's going to offer to give um, uh, Dick offers to give Frank tours of the city. And it's interesting what Mr. Whitney says. I like your looks and you will make a good guide for my nephew. I like your looks. It's really interesting, right? You look honest. And that's the whole idea of the fear of the con man, right? If you can promote yourself and seem to be forthcoming and, and uh, you, know, you, you can make it. But the important part of the story also is that as soon as uh, Dick has the opportunity of, of uh getting a job, which of course is going to come through to him through Mr. Whitney. Um, he's going to have to start to dress differently. He's going to be dressed in a suit. He's going to have to be properly educated. He's going to have to learn to speak properly. Uh, he's going to have to be able to present himself. So he's going to have to assimilate to the mainstream culture into the culture of the middle class, right? You can't have the speech patterns of a, of a guy on the street. Um, so if you want to do this, you've got to start developing your work and moral habits when you're young. You can always transform yourself when you're, when, when you're a little older. So the ratio of your story is interesting because it's, it's emphasizing the fact that you need to be able to sell yourself, right? You need to make yourself sellable. You need to be able to hustle a little bit. You need to be able to show social control. And you also need to be able to align yourself with members of people who are in a higher social class, whether you marry into that social class or whether you get jobs from them. So this idea of always being 
uh, deferential to the people a little bit higher than you, particularly people that, that might be able to hire you. Um, that's the key to success uh, in this new society. So the Ray Alger story gets told over and over again uh, in an important part of, uh, of the Jacksonian uh, culture. Now, another example of, of the sort of upward mobility and the whole idea of the con man is um, P.T. Barnum. And P.T. Barnum, you probably know him from the circus. Uh, he is obviously, is a, he's an a empresario. He goes out there and, and, and basically builds a brand around himself. Before he was a, uh, involved with the circus, he was involved in uh, all sorts of different uh, types of, of uh, swindling operations. But the interesting thing, so he basically presented himself uh, a little bit the way Donald Trump did as a very successful man, but also somebody who had a little bit of trickery in his background. So he was very much about uh, using publicity and advertising to get his name out there. Um, and he believed that everything that basically sold was good. So he believed this idea that what, it didn't matter the quality of what you were selling, what just it was important that people would buy it. So if you look at the old museum, right, the sort of classic museum, if you've ever been to the Peabody Museum at Harvard, for example, these natural history museums were about education. You're supposed to learn something at the museum, whether it's about fine art or whether it's about natural history. You're supposed to, it's supposed to be uh, about uh, some sort of uh, self-improvement. You're supposed to get something from the museum. Uh, if museums were frequently connected to universities, um, they had social status. It's a little bit like if you think about the Museum of Fine Arts or the Museum of Natural History in New York. I mean, these are these are institutions that are connected to the elite class. Now, when it came to P.T. Barnum, P.T. Barnum had a whole different idea of what museums were about. And for him, it was all about creating uh, displays that were entertaining. Literally, it was about entertainment uh, and it was about uh, trying to get people to, to buy things. So it was about, about commodifying um, that entertainment. So if you, from the very beginning, he's going to start to build his, his um, museum around people like Tom Thumb, who was a, a, a little person from Connecticut. Um, and he basically found this guy, he, he, he was, uh, not only was he small in stature, but he was talented, he could sing and he could dance. And so Tom Thumb became the international sensation, which he markets all over the, all over the country. Um, and so people come to the museum to see Tom Thumb, to be to, to see this, and not because Tom Thumb uh, necessarily offers you anything that's uplifting. Uh, there's nothing uplifting about it. It's just simply fun, and because he was he was uh, he becomes a sensation that everybody wants to see it. So he goes to the center of New York um, to Fifth Avenue and builds this museum, um, which. Uh, it's going to be a museum that's going to have all kinds of different um, uh, displays that are all revolving around um, hoaxes and staged controversies and staged competitions. And he begins with, you know, juggling competitions between an Irish immigrant and a Spanish immigrant and then a kind of an Americanized guy. And of course, it's all staged. So the, the Americanized guy will win and show the sort of superiority of American culture. Um, but it's a little bit like professional wrestling. Everybody knows it's it's staged, but it, it, uh, the, the, the competitions become very much about you know the crowd deciding what's you know what's um, what's good and what isn't. Um, the other aspect of this is uh, that he puts in things like this, which are this is called the Fiji mermaid, which was uh, part monkey, part fish, and uses this as an example of this sort of miraculous. And it's, you know, nothing more than a, uh, a monkey carcass uh, sewed together with a fish carcass. But this becomes a major display. Um, and again, this is right where they're beginning to talk about the theory of evolution, whether or not it's, 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 it's also disguising itself as quasi-educational. And the whole idea here was that whenever uh, sales were slow, he would, he would call out his own hoax. And the hoax, right, the, the idea that this was fake, would get more people to come see it. And, and the interesting thing about this is people would come and they, 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 would, they would admit that they had been scammed, but then they would go tell their friends to go see it too, um, trying to bring everyone else in on it. So what P.D. Barnum did is he sort of made everybody a con man. 
And this idea of what's good is what sells is really what P.T. Barnum is 